Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in your large world. It is my honor uh, to welcome everyone today to the last lecture of this year, uh, 2022, in our series, the Yale Lectures in Byzantine Art and Architecture. The lecture will be given by Dr. Brigitte Peterakis. Afterwards, Dr. Celine Unleonen of Oberlin College will give a commentary. Celine is a specialist in Ottoman and Persian manuscript illumination and has recently been looking into late Ottoman material. Our speaker, Brigitte Peterakis, is a researcher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, um, otherwise known as CNRS. Um, she specializes in Byzantine metalwork and the Byzantines' use of objects in daily life, setting them uh, within their artistic, economic, and political, and religious and social contexts. Dr. Peter, Peter Rakis received her doctorate in Byzantine art and archaeology from the Sorbonne, where she later taught for six years. She defended her habilitation in 2020. Her first book from 2006 dealt with bronze re cross reliquaries that the Byzantines wore on their chests. Currently, she is contributing to the major online um, resource titled Artifacts and Raw Materials in Byzantine Archival Documents. An important aspect of Dr. Peter Rakis' work has been her collaboration with scholars and institutions in Istanbul. The most recent project, her most recent project in that regard, is discovering Byzantium in Istanbul scholars, institutions, and challenges uh, 1800 to 1955, uh, published this year. Another I would recommend is the 2018 volume uh, titled Life is Short, Art Long, The Art of Healing of Byzantium uh, from, uh, as I said, 2018. Now on beh <clears throat> behalf of the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale, and the Departments of Classics and the History of Art, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Rakis to give her paper titled, Discovering the Byzantine Object in Late Ottoman Istanbul, Diplomacy, Archeology, span and Collecting. Uh, Dr. Peter Rakis, please share your screen. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will straight away start sharing my screen. And my paper tonight, uh, well, this uh, it's evening in Paris. It's noon in your uh, area. Discovering the Byzantine object in late Ottoman Istanbul, diplomacy, archaeology, and collecting. The importance attributed to the study of the Byzantine object within Byzantine studies has evolved substantially since the emergence of the discipline. Although movable objects are commonly classified as minor arts, uh, during the last decade, we have also witnessed a growing trend in refocusing the object to the core of the discipline. This trend has been mainly driven by the application to Byzantine studies of the anthropological concepts of agency, sensory experience, performativity, and materiality which led to placing the object within an interdisciplinary research involving art historians, historians, epigraphists, museum curators, conservators. My aim here is to consider the role of movable objects 
in shaping the Byzantine studies discipline during the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th. More specifically, focusing on, uh, uh, on the discovery of Byzantium in Istanbul in the late Ottoman Empire, I will aim to recontextualize the scientific work done around the monuments and architectural buildings through, uh, through the prism of portable objects. This will in turn allow me to explore and understand the trend towards collecting Byzantine artifacts at the personal, political, and diplomatic levels. During the Enlightenment, Objects from classical antiquity were highly sought after by Western European collectors, while Byzantine cultural objects were ignored or dismissed mainly because of the negative image of Byzantium perpetuated by the leading voices of the movement. The convergence of circumstances that led to a remarkable growth in interest in the Byzantine heritage at the Ottoman capital have been at the center of two recent projects that I undertook in collaboration with the Para Museum in Istanbul. The first was discovering Byzantium in Istanbul, scholars, institutions, and challenges, 118, uh, 1955, and uh, the papers of this scientific gathering were recently published by the Istanbul Research Institute. Taking inspiration from the symposium, I launched the second project, From Istanbul to Byzantium, Paths to Rediscovery, 1800-1955, an exhibition that I curated uh, for the Para Museum last winter. I attempted to contextualize the raising of awareness towards the Byzantine heritage by focusing on its multiple actors and their contribution. Let us now come to my presentation here. Which categories of Byzantine objects were available for collecting in late Ottoman Istanbul? What factors favored their discovery? How did artifacts end up in public and private collections? How did they contribute to the emerging field of Byzantine studies? By considering such questions, I will examine the contacts and other connections between the agents involved in the discovery, collection, and study of Byzantine objects in late Ottoman Istanbul. One, scholarship, art market, and diplomacy, a multicultural city in a new context. One perspective is through a set of uh, until now unpublished letters received by Gustave Schumberger now in the library of the Institut de France in Paris. The letters covering the period from the late 19th century to the first decade of the 20th century provide essential information on Byzantine news in Istanbul, including the discovery of remains, inscriptions, and objects. The most numerous group belongs to Albert Sorlin d'Origny, a French dentist established in Istanbul, who served as middleman to Schlumberger in his acquisitions of seals and other categories of objects. This contact with Sorlin Dorigny was probably established during Schlumberger's six month residency in Istanbul in 1879. During this day, it was Andreas David Mordman Jr son of the famous Orientalist Andreas David Mordman the Elder, who initiated him into the world of sigillography. 
A physician by profession and attached to the German hospital in, East, in Constantinople, Mordman had also established himself as the premier collector and expert on Byzantine lead seals. He dealt in them as well. In 1873, uh, Mordman had published in French a lecture on Byzantine lead seals that he had delivered at the Greek Philological Silogos of Constantinople. In the introduction, he provides revelatory information on the origins of important lead seals that landed on the antiquities market in Constantinople. Mordman states that in the last years preceding his conference, uh, the construction of the buildings within the enclosure of the Ministry of War, the Seras Kerat, which later became uh, the University of Istanbul, uh, required the removal of a large amount of soil and rubble, which was then dumped into the Marmara Sea. Southern winds soon drove the current to deposit, uh, to deposit lead seals on the shore, along with medals and various other objects. Men uh, whom Mortman calls Araijis uh, from the Turkish Araiju, meaning hunter or chiffonier in French, ragman, collected them in great quantities. One may assume that the remains of an administrative building of the Byzantine state had been reached during the construction works. Mordman also mentions the finds from the excavations in the Seraglio during rail, uh, railroad construction. These finds would go on to become part of the impressive collections assembled by the Ottoman statesman and renowned numismatist Supi Pasha, who obtained 150 pieces, Philippe Anton Détier, predecessor of Osman Hamdi Bey as director of the Ottoman Imperial Museum, then the numismatist and military doctor Makridi Bey, and uh, Mortman himself, who alone acquired 700 of the pieces. Concerning the framework of Byzantine objects that circulated in the art market of Istanbul, a cluster of testimonies by Schlumberger, point to the presence of statite icons, a more fragile medium than bronze ware that were more easily accessible. He acquired some of them and also studied and published one extraordinary example that had been beyond his budget, but was acquired by his close friend, Comtesse de Béarn an extravagant well-known figure in the cultural circles of Paris and eclectic collector of antiquities. Schlumberger states in his article on the well-known Etimacia steatite today in the Louvre that some of the steatites on the antiquities market in Istanbul had been acquired by the museum, he says, the Museum of the Russian Archaeological Institute. Another fragmentary piece with the feast cycle from the life of, of Christ today at the Benaki Museum also came from the collection of De Béarn. Schumberger also mentions two Byzantine statites that he himself owned, one with the standing figure of Saint Nicholas and a fragment bearing a representation of the Emperor Constantine the Great. Both are today at the Département des Monnaies, Médailles et Antiques of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. The latter would be displayed at the first Byzantine art exhibition held in Paris in 1931. And uh, one outstanding object at the time, acquired by Solan Dorigny, was a bronze polycandelon, a flat bronze disc weighing two to three kilograms and bearing eight openings, a votive inscription and a hook with a triple suspension chain attached to the disc by three rings. He wanted to send it to Schlumberger, 
so that he could deliver it to Antoine Heron de Villefosse, curator in the Department of Antiquities at the Louvre, as a gift to the museum. The piece was indeed presented to the Louvre and Schlumberger made an oral presentation about the object at a meeting at the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres in 1893. Today, the Polycandelon is kept at the Département des Antiquités Grecques, Etrusques et Romaines at the Louvre. Schlumberger published the piece in the Byzantine Shetsatri, uh, bearing witness to the fascination that such objects exerted on historians and archaeologists of the time. Solan and Dorigny's letters also contain precious data on the scholarly activities of the newly emerging Byzantinists in Istanbul. In an undated letter that fits into the year 1890, he says that the Berlin Museum had someone in Istanbul who buys at a golden price all Byzantine fragments that can be transported. This was probably Theodor Vigand, on whom I will return later in this presentation. In the same letter, he mentions a private docent, Josef Zygowski, sent by the University of Vienna, with whom he argues all the time. He has been here for eight months and prepares a history of Byzantine art, Solan Dorigny wrote. Last year, he spent several months in Venice and Ravenna. I perturb his ideas because overall he has only seen Merovingian objects at the Museum of Natural History in Vienna and only knows the museum in Mainz from plates and pictures. This fellow mixes the Germanic art imported into Italy by the Lombards, Goths, etc., et with Oriental Byzantine art, the art, the art uh, of the Lower, lower empire, he says. Despite Strigovsky's apparent shortcomings in Solan Dorigny's eyes, he adds that Strigovsky is nonetheless a hard worker and will do some good by publishing his Byzantine art. International collectors of Byzantine objects also chase the antiquities market in the Balkans. For instance, Schlumberger, uh, through the agency of the French consul in Filippopoli, acquired uh, the late 11th or 12th century secular silver plates of the so-called Isgirli treasure. He also acquired a set of silver armbands, which are today at the Louvre. These pieces raise the issue of the geographical distribution of a Byzantine secular repertory reappropriated by provincial workshops. I pass now to my second section on the uh, Imperial Museum in Constantinople. A first version of the Imperial Museum was established in the Church of Aya Irini in 1846. This was the result of the fact that the church served as an armory and as such, it also housed some antiquities. These first steps towards a museum were contemporary with the restoration work conducted in Hagia Sophia by Gaspare Fossati under the high commission of Sultan Abdul Majid. The restoration in Hagia Sophia took place from 1847 to 1849. A first draft of the catalog of the museum in Hagia Irini was published by Albert Dumont in Revue Archaeologique in 1868. This French archaeologist became director of the French school in Athens in 1875. Besides the Byzantine objects, a collection of stamped bricks with imperial monograms was also housed there. Philippe Anton Détier, appointed director at Ayairini in 1872, 
conducted the transfer of the museum to the Chinili kiosk in 1875. Then André Joubin, an archeologist from the French school in Athens was put in charge of making a museum out of what he compared to a shop at uh, the Istanbul's bazaar. In his task, uh, Joubin attempted to classify the material according to styles and chronological periods. Following the appointment of uh, Osman Hamdi Bey, as director in 1881, the construction of uh, new buildings of the museum was an, uh, oh no, uh, the construction of new buildings was entrusted to Alexandre Valéry, a Levantine architect educated at the Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris. As a model of modernity, the museum served as a symbolic bridge with the Europeans. The acquisition history of objects that entered the Imperial Museum during the 19th century is sometimes obscured with contradictory information that is impossible to verify. Sorting out complicated backgrounds through the sources is a challenging endeavor. Uh, the upper job, the serpent hand from the serpent column is such an example. One of the earliest pieces said to be on display at Ayayrini is, is this piece. Charles Newton saw it while pressing, passing through Istanbul in May 1852. In Travels and Discoveries in the Levant, published in 1865, he reports the widespread story that Gaspare Fossati found it in 1848 while digging near Hagia Sophia at the site of the Augusteum during construction of the Darul Funun, a building for Istanbul University that he designed in a book, uh, the uh, university that he designed. In a book devoted to the Serpent Column published in 1847, however, the Greek physician, Stephanos Karatheodori, had already reported uh, seeing the surviving head of the serpent in the beast garden. He additionally wrote that it had been transferred to the nearby hospital for the insane. The beast garden is probably the Arslanhane, the remains of which were destroyed to make way for Fossati's university building. Another piece which is part of the random discoveries of the period is the huge Medusa head today in the garden of the Archaeological Museum. According to the Reverend Curtis from the Crimean Church in Constantinople who published the volume Broken Bits of Byzantium, the piece is said to have been found in the foundations of a wooden house near the column of Constantine. The date of entry to the museum is 1916. With the establishment of the Imperial Museum and the reform of antiquities laws to protect the Ottoman Empire's archeological heritage, local governors in all the empire's territories were instructed to be on the lookout for intercept and send all kinds of antiquities to the museum in the capital. In parallel to this movement, representatives of Western museums or diplomats based in Constantinople and Asia Minor were on the alert to acquire what antiquities they could. Some of the major Byzantine treasures discovered in this period in Ottoman lands were dispatched to the museum in Istanbul. Today, they are on display in the new treasury rooms of the archeological museum. Thus, a ball, a ball from the Lampsacos treasure discovered in 1847, which is representative of domestic silver of the sixth or early seventh century, sits next to the sixth century liturgical silver from Stumate treasure, 
discovered south of Idlib in Aleppo Descript in Syria in 1908. Farmers near Lampsacos in northwestern Anatolia reportedly discovered the treasure in 1847 while digging in a field. Shortly thereafter, 13 pieces from the treasure came into possession of Henry Richard Charles Wellesley, Earl of Cowley, who held the office of minister at Constantinople between 1846 and 1848. Wellesley donated it to the British Museum in 1848. The museum went on to acquire five additional pieces in 1886 and three more in 1897 bringing its total to 21. The Louvre has two silver spoons from the treasure. Both were in the collection Briot in Smyrna in 1893. One reached the Briot collection through that of Citridis, British consular agent in Gallipoli who sold it in 1865. They were acquired by the Louvre in 1894. One of the earliest major pieces to enter the collections of Ayairini is the famous large silver plate bearing the so-called personification of India from the Lampsacos treasure. Edward Gould uh, illustrated the plate as a lithography in his catalog published in 1871. It had also been seen there earlier in 1852 by Charles Newton. The link to India derives from the elephant tusks used to the seat, used for the seat upon which the female personification sits. The distinctive headdresses of the animal trainers accompanying the panthers and monks in the foreground are often compared with the figures in the lower portion of the Barberini ivory at the Louvre, one among which carries an elephant tusk. These have equally been identified as Indians. Anthony Cutler has argued that large elephant tusks have, uh, like those carved in early diptychs and pixies, came from Egypt, but India was also a major source of ivory in early Byzantium, he said. On the large plate, uh, the subject of hunting would be recognized by social elites as part of their pedia while the exotic elements stood to enhance the status, high standing and wealth of the patron. A prototype for the image may be found in the hunting pavement dated to the fourth century at the Villa Romana del Casale in Piazza Armerina, depicting a typical activity of a Roman aristocrat. The figure is commonly identified as the personification of India, although the alternative of Ethiopia has uh, also been recently uh, suggested. The small medallions of the outer border of the plate depict uh, profile busts uh, as imitations of gold coins. The closest parallel is the so-called Anastasius dish from, uh, from the Saturn Who ship burial. The object bears four control stamps of Emperor Anastasius. Here the reference to coins is to be found in the stylized image of the uh, personification of Constantinople. Two further pieces from uh, Lampsaco's treasure had, uh, that had reached the Imperial Museum in Istanbul are a pair of shallow balls, stamped balls with a cruciform monogram that, they, uh, that may read Amin or Mina. 
The balls formed a set with two others, two identical others at the British Museum. Their stamps testify that they were manufactured during the reign of Heraclius. Johannes Heinrich Mortmann, the second son of the Orientalist Andreas David Mortmann, produced an interesting early scholarly testimony on the Lampsacos treasure in an article on inscriptions from Gallipoli. He wrote that at the time of its discovery, the treasure was held by a certain Yanko Chaleb Celebi in Gallipoli. Some pieces from the find were also at the Imperial Museum, he says. Besides the plate with the personification of India, Mortman also saw a lampsaco spoon bearing a hexameter from a Virgil, a clock 1069. Love conquers all and we yield to love. He claims that the Chinilikos possessed a large variety of such spoons, but he could not access them. The spoons do not appear in the inventories of the Istanbul Archaeological Museums. It would seem that at some point, some of the museum's Lampsaco spoons were transferred to the uh, British Museum or elsewhere. These spoons dated to the sixth century form a consistent group. All have inscriptions uh, on the ball and on top of the handle. Five include a line from the anonymous Greek epigram on the seven sages, well known in late antiquity and Byzantium and preserved in the Palatine Anthology. The inscriptions constitute a playful exchange. On three spoons, lines of Latin poetry are coupled with the poetic response in Greek. For instance, Virgil's love conquers all and we yield to love receives the Greek response, eat you who are lovesick. A spoon from Gallipoli bearing a Latin and Greek inscription also appears in the catalog of the Museum of the Evangelical School in Smyrna compiled by Athanasios Papadopoulos Kerameps. This spoon lost today was also probably part of the former Lampsacos lot. It was also published by the French, uh, by the famous French archeologist Solomon Reiner in the uh, Bulletin de Correspondance Hellenique. As in the previous examples, its two inscriptions are interactive. An anonymous Roman epigraph states, baths, wine, and love make death come faster. And the witty reply warns amidst incenses, watch your hernia. One among the earliest acquisitions of Byzantine objects from Anatolia in the Imperial Museum is a bucket from Zerzevan Castle near Diyarbakir, which entered the collection in 1895. The punched inscription around the rim uh, arose the immediate interest of scholarship. One reads, for the fulfillment of the vow and salvation of Antipatros and the latter's household, Lord protect thee. Uh, among the letters uh, of Gustave Schlimberger that I mentioned in the beginning, some uh, came from a, a priest called Father Sofron from the Assumptionist Institute in Istanbul. And uh, you know, within these letters, we find uh, interesting testimony on the early stages of research around this object. In a letter from 1901, Father Sofron says that he's working on a bucket about which he had already consulted Schlumberger. It would seem that Schlumberger had suggested for this piece a date in the 15th century, but this is a sixth century piece. Uh, Sofron questions uh, Schlumberger's dating of the object uh, which bears, he says, an inscription from an Antipatros. 
probably Sophron uh, thought that uh, thought uh, of an antipathos as a civil gover govern governor rather than the personal name Antipatros. But he was right to think that the object is earlier than the 15th century. And until now, unpublished drawing of the decorative layout of the bucket and its inscription are found among a selection of drawings of Byzantine churches in Constantinople made by Adolphe Thiers, who uh, for the book he published in collaboration with Jean Ebersold in 1913. The drawings are today kept at the Photothèque Gabriel Millet, Collection Chrétienne et Byzantine at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris. Ebersold published the bucket without an illustration as part of a selection of medals, amulets, and other objects from the Istanbul Archaeological Museums. Uh, I discovered this drawing by chance uh, while looking at the drawings of churches. Then one chalice shaped goblet with animal motifs from the treasure found in Vrap in 1902 has reached the Istanbul Archaeological Museum the same year. The treasure consists of vessels and personal adornment of gold uh, or silver gilt or copper gilt. 41 vessels are known. Some, uh, the, the biggest uh, part is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and one drinking bowl at the Water Art Museum in Baltimore. Josef Strykowski is among the pioneer scholars who studied this non-homogeneous material. The area of rap is in the immediate vicinity of the Via Gnatia, halfway between the Rachion, capital of the province of Epirus Nova, and the Byzantine fortress at Scampa. Recent bibliography tends to interpret the finds in light of Brap's role as a provincial Byzantine border culture of the eighth century. It has been argued that it may be associated with the local elite, perhaps an ar arho. The Istanbul goblet is decorated in the repoussé technique. It has eight medallions with birds eating uh, a worm or a serpent. It presents similarities with the Guinea fall of the Lampsacos plate, a goose or chicken or, uh, so uh, the origins can be found in early Byzantine art. The purchase of the wrap pieces by G.P. Morgan happened some 10 years after they had come to light and already been dispersed. The making of this treasure in the 20th century was, stu was studied by Melanie Holcomb under a title which starts with ugly but important in reference to the expression used by the purchasing agent for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1911 in a letter addressed to the then director of the Met, Edward Robinson. Uh, now, uh, the last section of my paper, Diplomacy, Byzantine Collections and Archaeology from Late Ottoman Istanbul to the Years of Occupation. Nikodim Kondakov's study of the mosaics of Kora in the 1880s was a pioneering attempt towards a shift of interest towards the art and archaeology of Constantinople which had long been dismissed. Kondakov's uh, assessment of the mosaics led to disentangle them from the widely accepted claims of Western influence and their artificial attribution to a follower of Giotto. The art of Carrier was an independent expression of Byzantine art. 
such a reframing of the reception and perception of Byzantine art created a favorable ground for the establishment of the Russian Archaeological Institute. The Institute was founded in 1895 through the agency of Alexander Nelitov, the Russian ambassador in Istanbul. Fedor Ivanovich Uspensky, director of the Institute, was an art historian, archaeologist, and epigraphist from the University of Odessa, mainly interested in manuscripts. But as director of the Institute, he also undertook uh, archaeological investigations in Constantinople. In 1897, in the holy fountain of Sulumanaster, the former uh, Peripleptos church, he discovered a series of important reliefs that were acquired in 1899 by the Berlin Museum. Among these are the famous reliefs with the Virgin and uh, Archangel Michael dated to the 12th or 13th century. Uh, three years after its establishment, the Russian Archaeological Institute had obtained general permission from Sultan Abdul Hamid to excavate in Ottoman territory. And in 1907, Boris Panchenko from the, uh, from the Institute discovered the Studios Monastery. The Russian interest in this site lighten the fact that it was located between the two uh, new railway stations of Samatya and Yedikule. He got authorizations to excavate the site and of note discovered a cruciform crypt, a number of uh, marble reliefs and a small enamel medallion from the 11th or 12th century with a boss uh, with a bust of St. Jacobus. World War I interrupted the excavations and together with the 1917 Russian Revolution, it led to the Institute's closure. Byzantine enamels were particularly coveted since the luxurious catalog of the enamel collection of Alexander Svenigorodskoy by Nikola Kontakov dedicated to Tsar Nicholas III. I just show a few images. Oops. Uspensky uh, kept himself informed about the discovery of Byzantine artifacts throughout the city and was also in contact with antique dealers. The Russian Institute also housed a collection of Byzantine artifacts, then forming the nucleus of a small private museum. The pieces are today kept in the Istanbul Archaeological Museums. They are representative of the categories available on the antiquities market at the time and offer interesting insight into the devotional practices and daily life in Byzantium. The bronze objects include a cylindrical incense burner with an engraved inscription around the mouth that links the piece to the category of copper alloys with double stroke lettering, dated to the 11th or 12th century. There's also a variety of bronze pectoral crosses, including a type with the cast image of Christ on the cross dated to the 11th or 12th century which has been imitated by workshops in Russia in the 12th century. Among the metal objects from the Russian collection, now in the Istanbul Archaeological Museums, one also finds a category of female mantle clasps formed by hinging two halves together. The surface bears a representation of a stylized bust uh, similar to the saintly figures engraved on some 11th century pectoral reliquary crosses. The collection also included a large bronze openwork medallion from the monumental lighting device or Horus 
of the Church of St. Demetrius at Markov Monastery, dated to the last quarter of the 14th century. It bears the dedicatory inscription in Old Slavonic by King Vukashin, uh, founder of the church. A similar medallion of the same device is kept at the National Museum of Serbia in Belgrade, where it arrived in 1871. The other parts of the monumental chandelier were transferred to uh, Sofia in 1908. The Institute also held a fragmentary bone plaque bearing a carved figure um, uh, accompanied by an inscription suggesting the identification of the prophet El Elijah. And there are also, there's also a bust of the Virgin wearing the Maphorion with the cross engraved on the forehead. Uh, besides the Russians, there were also the Germans. Now I pass to Theodor Vigand that I mentioned in the beginning. In the 1890s, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm had developed an interest for Byzantine art. Through the agency of Theodor Wigand, who had the position of director of the Berlin Museum operations in Turkey and scientific attaché to the German embassy in Constantinople, he undertook an eager pursuit of Byzantine objects in the lands of the Ottoman Empire to enrich the collections of the Kaiser Friedrich Museum. The German Kaiser's dealings had obviously a strong impact in the legitimation of the Imperial Museum's own Byzantine collections. At MLDM has discussed a, a document from the Ottoman archives containing a list of prospective acquisitions that Kaiser Wilhelm had sent to his ally Abdul Hamid II through the agency of Theodor Vigand in 1898. These are seven capitals from Istanbul, a stone, probably marble from the Black Sea, and a stone from Thessaloniki, which probably consisted in the famous ambo from the Church of St. George. But the session of the ambos was objected by Osman Hamtipe's brother, Halil Edem, who succeeded him, and the object reached the Imperial Museum. In 1900, uh, Wigand married uh, Marie von Siemens. His father-in-law, George von Siemens, was the managing director of Deutsche Bank, which was awarded the concession for construction of the Baghdad Railway. The Ottoman railway network, emblem of the empire's modernization, was largely designed and bankrolled by German corporations. A pamphlet circulated by the Berlin State Museums among the German engineers of the Baghdad Railway outlined the ways in which they could render assistance to the German empire and the state museums. With this pamphlet, the museum's director, Theodor Wigand, alerted the engineers to their potential to become pioneers in three forms of knowledge, geographic, topographic, and archeological, and describes the way in which they could do this while building the Sultan's railway. And now I will finish with an example which goes beyond uh, the uh, late Ottoman uh, framework, but I would like to uh, introduce uh, Stanley Casson's uh, contribution. In a report on the discoveries from Fenari Sajami in 1929, Stanley Casson, who was accompanying Macri de Bay from the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, states that of minor objects found in the building, one of the most important ones was a large part of the stalactite icon, exquisitely carved, he says, depicting a scene from the life of Christ, 
which has not been satisfactorily interpreted, he says. He says that the small icon was found in a tomb. One interesting testimony with regard to statites as collector items in this period comes from a publication by the same Casson in the Burlington Magazine for Connoisseurs of 1928 of a fragmentary statite, which he says belonged to Professor Tille of Robert College in Istanbul. Tille would have brought it in Prusa a few years ago, he says. He dated the piece to the 12th century and says that no other icon of quite this type exists. He compares the high quality craftsmanship of the piece to works of ivory. Casson was a collector himself and may also have acted as in between with antique dealers. One letter by Royal Tyler to Mildred Barnes Bliss of uh, April 1928 offers a valuable testimony. Royal Tyler was the principal advisor to the Blisses in their formation of their Byzantine collection and was also the principal organizer of the International Byzantine Exhibition in Paris in 1931. In, in his letter, he says that he has just received the photograph of a silver object. The object is of silver and it looks very good. Dates, te, uh, date 1060, 1070, he says. Mais voici le chien d'or, he writes. It belongs to Casson of the new college Oxford, who conducted the excavations in the Constantinople Hippodrome last year. And Casson modestly wants 2000 pounds for it. It isn't often that a gentleman gets hold of anything that one would like to buy, but when he does. This is an embossed silver icon of the Virgin at the Walters Art Museum, 12th century. The relief was in the possession of Stanley Casson before 1930 and may have remained with him until his death. And now to conclude, in conclusion, in the late Ottoman period, a convergence of circumstances with roots in the 16th century Renaissance favored a renewal of curiosity and scholarly interest in the Byzantine past. Beginning with manuscripts and written sources, interest later shifted toward material remains and objects. A spike in the acquisition of Byzantine objects on the local antiquities market stemmed in part from the introduction of modern infra infrastructure such as railway construction in Istanbul and throughout Anatolia and urban planning in conjunction with the growing role of the Imperial Museum in state cultural policy and diplomacy of the late Ottoman Empire and the emergence of a group of scholar collectors. This emerging passion for the Byzantine object enriched the collections of museums in the West. From the perspective of scholarly interest, however, the modernist era produced new study horizons that mainly focused on, monument, on monumental art and some high luxury objects. It is only towards the 1990s with the organization of new international exhibitions that the study of Byzantine objects from daily life again stood at the center of attention within the discipline. The acquisition history of objects provides a valuable tool offering new insight into the links between the art market, Byzantine studies and international Diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Petarakis. This was a real pleasure to listen to. Um, and uh, uh, your talk animates a kind of lively world of collecting and a wide range of works uh, in numerous collections. Um, it really is 
truly kind of breathtaking in range and scale. You know, you um, focus on the personal, the political, and diplomatic levels. Um, and uh, the study you shared with us today brings together a network of agents and institutions to illustrate how uh, Byzantine studies changed during the second half of the 19th century uh, in light of what was available uh, in the art market in, in Istanbul. Uh, and how scholars, collectors studied these materials and how uh, kind of diplomacy came to play in all these. Um, and one thread that runs uh, throughout um, the, the cases that you studied is of course how the art market and the collecting practices parallel Ottoman modernization in infrastructure uh, such as railroad projects um, and the Imperial Museum. Um, this reminds me of something. So, um the when you were discussing the new context uh the new urban context for constantinople um you uh, brought up two buildings separately one is the Serest complex um and the other is the of course the imperial museum um these two buildings also share uh something else in common which is that they are two of the earliest um earliest buildings in 19th century istanbul to um publicly display their name on their facades. Um, and I think this is you know, based on um, a, an article that Erham Al Aldam had, had written, which you know, you, you've alluded to his other work. Um, and um, the, the name of the uh, Imperial Museum is written in an archaizing script, um, in, in the Kufic script. Um, and I think um, connecting this with the account uh, of Mortman that you shared about how during the excavation, uh, not excavations, during the um, during the building of the Saraskara uh, complex, the rubble and the um, the rubble and the soil that had been dumped into the water later revealed this large number of seals that had been collected by um, a number of people who were connected to the Imperial Museum, and so these seals, some of them ended up in the in the museum. I think is very um, illustrative um, of how um, urban planning is not just uncovering these objects, these, um, but the new urban context of creating a new kind of modern city with the names of the buildings inscribed on them, you know, in a in a public public way. Um, that context is also being shaped internally um, by what they uncover during urban projects and railroad constructions. So it isn't just that um, new building projects and railroads are uh, flooding the market with new portable Byzantine objects, but also the very uh, modern face of the, of the city um, is being shaped by these. Uh, yes, uh, uh, what I wanted to show is the connection uh, between uh, the emergence of modern Istanbul and uh, uh, chronologically speaking, the emergence of uh, Byzantine archaeology uh, in the city. Uh, a category of objects that I didn't um, discuss today was, um, which was very present is also the ceramic shirts, for instance. Uh, tons of ceramic shirts also came out. And uh, what interested me is that, uh, for instance, uh, you all see that uh, these are not the outstanding luxury pieces. I mean, uh, these outstanding um, enamels, ivories, etc., uh, which are in European collections, uh, Western or American, because um, th this uh, finds which um, made uh, scholarly work are mostly finds which came out in the in this period in the uh, mid 19th, 19th 20th century and first of all they were uh, they interested people like Schlumberger because of their inscriptions because of their historical or prosopographical uh, interest and um, I have the feeling that there were two categories. On the one hand, there was the category which had the uh, which was used as a historical source, 
So epigraphy, for instance, the bucket. And the others in the letters by uh, Touche-Lomberger, we uh, find the word uh, objet de vitrine in French, like display. Uh, they were used like decorative objects too uh, within this period. Uh, so uh, the, the Russians also collected this kind of small things that they could place in display cases. So this was perhaps um, the way uh, the, the objects were put on display was also the mechanism which um, led to acquiring objects of various materials, one next to the other. So it's interesting perhaps to look at how uh, these collections were collected. It was not, um, it was a, a perception with, which was different than the one we have today because it was related to the overall uh, social and cultural context. Yes, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm really interested in what you, said in passing uh, about differences in, in collections and in what's in kind of Western institutions and, um, and the Imperial uh, Museum. Um, so one example that I think you had was um, the wrapped treasure and some, some objects from that treasure ended up at the Met, some are at the Baltimore, uh, some are in Baltimore and some are uh, in the Imperial uh, Museum. And I think sometimes when, um, people write about the Imperial Museum, there's a sense that there's something anachronistic almost about this institution, that it is trying to catch up with European institutions and, um, um, or, um, or maybe it may be an, um, uh, an instance of Ottomans trying to project retroactively an identity, um, an Imperial identity. Um, but at the same time, it looks just based on this wrap treasure example um, that they, uh, the Imperial Museum was collecting in the same way some of these other institutions were collecting. So I was wondering what your, uh, if you could comment on this a little bit. Do you see that, um, do you see the way the Imperial Museum functioned um, at this time as analogous to how the, uh, how its Western counterparts were collecting and um, developing their, um, their collections? Yes, uh, well, they did from from the very beginning uh, there was an intention uh, this uh, goes together with the period of tanzimat uh, the the reform of uh, the ottoman reforms um, they wanted to make uh, the image of a civilized uh, nation uh, com uh, and so when Abdul Majid also uh, with the restoration of Hagia Sophia was also uh, such a, an example. Um, but uh, in the beginning, of course, the thing is that they lacked, uh, they lacked uh, professionals. And at the Istanbul Museum, uh, people until uh, around Osman Hamdibe, uh, people from the Many of the scholars, uh, archaeologists, were from uh, the French school in Athens. At the time, they had connection with the French school because uh, Osman Hamdi Bey was well connected with the French Academy. Uh, so uh, there was, for instance, Gustave Mendel, who made the, the sculpture catalog. So I think it was, uh, we can compare, but what happens is that the, the uh, level of diplomacy uh, as the, the, the power of, of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and uh, especially Kaiser uh, made that some objects left uh, the country, uh, but uh, not the, the collections were, but there was a, even, for instance, somebody like Osman Hamdibe, who was not uh, directly, let's say, interested in Byzantium, he, uh, he also brought himself uh, objects which are Byzantine. Uh, they were interested, you know, the interesting thing is that they, they were attracted by any kind of object which had, uh, um, which was antique. So even uh, very small objects, even uh, uh, a modest piece, 
uh, was interesting to them. So among the finds or objects that were brought by Osman Hamdi Bey uh, to the museum, uh, there were like, you know, even a chain or something uh, very simple. Uh, but uh, it was a period that curiosity was at its stop and uh, they wanted to gather. They thought that gathering the maximum would bring new, uh, will open new horizons to knowledge. That makes sense, thank you. Um, I, so I have a very kind of a trivial question. <laughs> Um, which is about um, one of the inscriptions that you showed, and then maybe we can, I'll talk a little bit more about these inscriptions. But um, so uh, I think you showed an object from the Lampsakos treasury um, and um, the, the call and response and the reply is, and it's instant, uh, incenses watch your hernia. Could you just explain the connection between incenses and hernia? Uh, uh, to be honest, this uh, inscription uh, belongs to an object that was lost. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, I uh, mean, we don't have. So the only thing we have is the transcription which was made. I have to say that uh, um, I, I'm not 100%, well, I, I accept what was, because it was uh, Papadopoulos Keramets who was a very uh, uh, alert in, uh, reading Greek since he became a big specialist of manuscript. So I, I guess that it was uh, uh, okay, but uh, well, maybe uh, if you uh, imagine a symposium, people uh, lie on a, uh, around the Sigma table. Uh, so I, I don't know if the inscription is okay, then uh, for instance, you can imagine that these people were lying uh, on, uh, on the side and maybe it was uh, something, uh, it will bring uh, an ache, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I wondered at some point, but I cannot prove because the object uh, is not preserved and, um, and uh, the transcription must be good, but Kili in Greek, uh, is uh, the her uh, tra translated as hernia, uh, but there is also the word klini, which is the the seat. Uh, so uh, I wondered if there was a mistake or something, but this uh, is impossible to to demonstrate. I see. Um, so kind of moving from this specific instance to. Uh, methodologies in general. Um, I was, so you offer a really kind of compelling narrative about the kinds of works that Byzantinists studied and how that shifted um, in the in the 19th century. Um, at the same time, it looks like, um, you know, even, um, even as the scholarly interest moves from um, smaller objects to uh, um, architect, large scale architecture, or the monumental, um, one thing that remains a consistent tool, it seems, in the in the toolbox of Byzantines is, is their uh, interest in epigraphy and in uh, word and image uh, studies. So um, I was wondering, in, uh, in addition to seeing a, a shift in the material study, do you see a shift in the methodologies? Uh, so put differently, anything, um, does anything from this uh, formative period in the 19th century have uh, some bearing on the contemporary interests or contemporary studies that take up questions of agency, materiality, and sensory. So what can uh, we learn from that period and bring it uh, to the, the kind of um, scholarly trends of the last decade or so that you outlined in your talk? Well, something very important is that these people in the 19th century had uh, little examples in mind to compare. Uh, I have to say that myself, when I, I, I started working on my dissertation in the in 1995, 94, there were very little uh, number of catalogs and uh, uh, comparative material. Uh, 
At the time, there was Splendeur de Byzance exhibition in, in, in Brussels, the Paris exhibition, and even then uh, the, the Met exhibition came out. And today, if you can, if you look, there are so many like monastic treasures, uh, objects and everything. So uh, uh, before the methodology, it's a question of access uh, to materials. But uh, what I, um, when I started looking at Schlumberger's letters and the interest, the passion, I have the feeling that there was a gap between this period and let's say roughly not today, but the last 10 years, the last decade. And now there is a return to this beginning because these people, uh, even if they didn't write everything in, in scientific papers, they, uh, they were interested in, uh, Schlumberger was interested, for instance, he used, um, even if he didn't comment them, he used images of objects in his history of Byzantium. Uh, they had a, a, a feeling to, to use the objects um, as an illustration of a historical uh, context but they didn't have enough uh, comparative material to build up, uh, to build up uh, a methodology that like we can build up today. Thank you. Um, the, so this uh, question of both what's available to scholars and also professionals um, in the employ of museums kind of comes up again. Um, Yes, yes, it's after the publication of most corpuses or objects uh, or uh, that even epigraphists, for instance, uh, who of course were aware of uh, ins inscribed objects, started doing uh, new work around um, the objects. Oh, um, thank you so much. This. Um... This was, again, a true pleasure to uh, listen to your talk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also to the organizers of uh, which uh, this allowed me to, to present uh, my uh, this recent work around the exhibition and the symposium. Yes, and I want to extend my thanks also, uh, uh, Brigitte and Our presence. Um, one time, I, and I want to ask you a question about the collections of bronze objects of everyday life in the Domedil collection in Houston. Uh, are you familiar with the collection? Yes, uh, I even, uh, yes, when I was fellow at Dumbarton Oaks uh -huh. many long years ago, uh, I even made a trip to to Houston to see, but at the time, uh, well, I didn't have access to all the material um, because I, could, <coughs> I was working on crosses, and um, and so uh, it's not when you ask for permissions, it's for a specific category, and so I. Uh, but I'm aware, of course, uh, of of uh, what. Uh, what has been published and uh, what exists and um, well my, my question has to do with how they got there i once heard a fascinating lecture that dominique dominio the the yeah. patroness of the collection gave about her uncle uh gustave schlumberger and she talked about him and uh he was a very august figure and she was a, a little girl and uh but she talked about his interest in Byzantine objects. Um, knowing that uh, many of those bronze objects in Houston most likely came from Turkey, is there any evidence? That, do we know how she got these objects or did she get them through her uncle or do we know anything about that? Personally, I don't. Okay. But 
I have the feeling, but uh, this is just, you know, when I was preparing this talk, when I was uh, going through all this correspondence of the blisses and stuff, I'm not sure, but I have a feeling that I saw the name Zako somewhere, but I'm not 100% sure. But yes. Zako, for instance, was one of the major antiquarians in, in uh, and some of the pieces are today in Geneva. But uh, on a, maybe he uh, was one of the, uh, there were two major uh, dealers in, in Istanbul at the time. Uh, one, one was Andronikos was his name, which appears in the correspondences and uh, Zakos later. I didn't mention Zakos because Zakos was later in the sixties. It goes beyond the chronology I, uh, I use today. Uh, maybe it was through them, but uh, I don't know. I, I have no knowledge about uh, how they acquired them. But uh, when you compare this object to the other objects that I know, um, they are certainly from Constantinople. Yeah, yeah, the, the, well, the provenance. Well, thank you very much. Um, for this lecture and, and uh, our thanks go to Celine also for her commentary. Um, and it's my duty to, to mention to everyone that our, our next lecture uh, in January uh, will be by Anastasia Thrandaki of the University of Athens. She will speak about the golden threads of orthodoxy, revisiting the materiality and function of early Paleologan epitaphii. Um, I might very much look forward to this paper because uh, she discovered and, uh, and acquired for her museum a, a spectacular epitaphios uh, uh, very recently. Uh, so very much look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, I wish everybody um, successful and happy holidays. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and I will see you in uh, 2023. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.